So today we have uh, Jorge Sepulcre. Um, thank you for agreeing uh, to, to talk. So Jorge um, graduated from uh, Navarra University in Spain. In 2004, he got his uh, MD and PhD um, with a major in neuro neurology and uh, neuroscience. And he joined the uh, Martino Center and um, Randy Buckner's lab at Harvard University in 2008. And uh, his main research interest is to develop uh, like structural and functional connectivity techniques. And he's um, mainly interested in, in applying these techniques uh, to um, study large-scale networks and apply like to uh, cognitive uh, impairment in, in uh, neurology patients. So today he's going to talk about large-scale connectome of the model brain. Thank you for, for the introduction. Um, so, uh, as uh, it says, uh, the, the, I'm going to talk about the large scale connectome of the of the model brain, and I'm really speaking, uh, you know, about the connectivity patterns of the three major sensory cortices in the in the brain of humans, like visual, auditory, and somatosensory cortex. The talk consists in um, in four parts. The first one, I'll be uh, introducing a little bit the topic of this of this research. Uh, in the second one, I'll be presenting some general concepts about the, the brain networks and graph theory in, in neuroimaging. In the third part, I'll be showing the, the main results of the study, and um, finally, uh, I will end up with some um, conclusions. Multimodal integration of sensory systems um, is a fundamental organizational property of, of the brain. You, you see a, a, like a, a wide spectrum of, of methodological approaches uh, neuroscientists have uh, spent an enormous uh, effort to elucidate the, the pathways by which the, the brain integrates external information to create uh, like a, a sense of, of reality. You know? um, for instance, anatomical work uh, uh, carried uh, out on, on non-human uh, primates like uh, John St. Powell or Goldman Rakik uh, did in the past. Uh, you know, this work laid the foundation of uh, on which uh, modern studies now are, are uh, or have built upon uh, in order to, to describe the, the convergence of perceptual modalities. So we have evidence of, of regions in the, in the brain that, have, that are involved in bimodal and, and trimodal integration, for instance, areas in the, um, in the human lateral cerebral temporal uh, cortex, also prefrontal cortex, uh, posterior parietal cortex. Um, other subcortical regions, like the, the um, superior colliculus, are also involved in this integration of, of different modalities, sensory modalities. However, I think that uh, we have to recognize that um, after several decades uh, studying this, this topic, uh, we don't know much about the, how is the perceptual convergence, or how is happening this perceptual convergence, and how from these uh, com uh, convergence zones, we jump to the uh, high order uh, cognitive hubs, if you like. So even though this rather patchy organization uh, uh, of the brain exists, now we know these, these different regions that converge modalities, uh, and these regions give, give us probably a glimpse uh, of the uh, hierarchical sensory convergence, uh, I think it definitely remains elusive uh, how is the articulation of the flow of information from these modality related regions to the, to the more parallel cognitive uh, processing systems. Or, uh, if you like, in other words, uh, it remains a critical challenge for uh, neuroscience to determine the, the articulation of the flow of information from the sensation to the cognition. Right? On the other hand, I think I'm not exaggerating if I say that the, uh, the last decade has been the decade of, of networks you know, in, in society and in science in general. And that's also the case for, for neuroscience. Uh, since the discovery of the deformal network by Schulman and, and Gretel and others, uh, we, we have witnessed the characterization of different networks in the brain. Like uh, People are agree that between seven to 10 networks are really like reliable uh, there as a functional connectivity networks. Um, uh, like, for instance, the, the, dorsal, I mean the default mode network, dorsal tension, uh, silence network, etc. And, and I'm sure that there are, uh, this number is going to increase in the, in the near future because we are increasing also the, the 
the technology, or, or we are increasing the resolution that we have in the uh, in our uh, mirror imaging techniques. But obviously, uh, the concept of of brain networks is not new by any means. I mean, the, 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 uh, the working hypothesis of, of brain networks is there. Is to, I mean, the history of neuroscience is full of of this working hypothesis. No? A clear example is the study of early versions of the default mode network at the structural level. And also, uh, it's interesting how the Middle Asian maps done in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, we can see also the early versions of the, of the default mode network. So it's interesting because the more you review the you know, early anatomical papers, the more you realize that all these networks were, were there, obviously. Uh, so w one may wonder, wh what is the real novelty that we have today uh, in this network science that we are doing? And for me, uh, without any doubt, the, the most interesting property that we have, uh, we can take advantage today is the possibility of studying the functional coherence of these networks. No? So in this sense, the, the actual achievement of the discovery of the formal network it was not to describe the, the connections of the network. It was more to, to see that this network was a, a really dominant network, like a really uh, uh, dominant coherent network in, in, in the brain. No? And by definition, all this information, I mean, early anatomies were totally blind to this functional information at large scale. Level. Uh, and now we have also a, another advantage compared to previous research or uh, uh, compared to the early uh, anatomies, no? we have the technology and also the resolution to to study the brain as a whole network. So we have these very nice analytical tools and, uh, and frameworks uh, to do so. And, and one of them is graph theory. I mean, I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with this approach because it, is, it was originally uh, developed in social science and. Uh, to, to try to understand the complex social interactions and, uh, and through internet, I mean, we are really familiar to this kind of, of, of graphs. Um, and in my opinion, this, this framework has been really successful because it's a really simple way to, to try to formalize complex problems. You know? uh, it's a great language to, to by, by def defining uh, ages and links, so ages and, and nodes. Uh, we can we can uh, try to reduce the dimensionality of really complicated or, uh, biological problems. In this sense, we have done uh, several contributions in developing um, you know a couple of algorithms and metrics uh, in the neuroimaging field. Uh, in this case, for instance, this is a paper that we describe the distribution of cortical halves in the human brain. Um, and I'm not going to go in details of, of this study, but what we did is to uh, to, up, to uh, apply a, a particular degree connectivity strategy uh, to compute the number of functional links for every voxel in the brain in a high resolution manner. And by doing so, we reveal uh, a set of regions that are essential for the integration of, inf of information in the brain, uh, most likely uh, regions that are involved in high or in cognitive uh, related information, if you like. Another contribution that, that we did was to, to characterize the most important regions um, of the brain that have local and distant connectivity. Uh, so at the analytical level, we segregate the local and distant connections for each voxel in the brain, taking into account the different levels of, of neighborhoods. Uh, and what we found is that this really, really kind of simple property of segregating the predominance in local and distant connections uh, accounts for the for the separation of primary regions and heteromodal regions. I think it, it, we focus on this figure here in the bottom left. So uh, you can see that the, the regions that we have under. So we, we can see that the you know regions of primary uh, cortex uh, is thank you. Uh, here yeah, somatosensory, motor, auditory, and visual. They all display 
uh, really high local uh, predominance, uh, local connectivity. Uh, and in the thermal regions, like in blue color, we see that they have a, a preferential distant connection. However, after, after finishing this project, um, you know, uh, we were a little bit confused because because this method maximized the segregation, obviously, between the local and distant uh, regions, uh, but it does it, it doesn't really tell us how the information the connectivity jumps from here to the uh, heteromodal regions, and that's the uh, you know the hypothesis that we have, right? That from primary cortex uh, the, the information travels to these higher order uh, regions of the brain. Because we, what we want to, to really know is how is this flow of information right, from sensation to cognition. So that's why we developed uh, another network approach, uh, something that we have called the stepwise functional connectivity analysis. And the idea is to analyze not only the, the direct connectivity of, of a given region, that is, this is the, the conventional uh, uh, functional connectivity MRI, so you put a sit here and you see the, uh, the direct connections in a star net topology. Uh, we want to move forward and try to take advantage of the whole brain connectivity network uh, of the individuals to try to see the connectivity not only at the direct level, also in the, in the you know, neighbors of my neighbors, of my neighbors, etc. So uh, I think this is quite interesting because, you know, the majority of network methods uh, out there are trying to, to describe uh, the brain networks, or, uh, so I are trying to separate or to isolate the networks in the brain. Because 10 years ago, we didn't know the, uh, uh, which network we have in the brain. Uh, more or less, so, so uh, at the functional level. So people were obviously trying to, to differentiate the networks. In this case, it's important to, to know that we are going in, a, going in, a, in another direction. So uh, it's, it's a complementary direction, but it's definitely another direction because we are trying to see how these systems merge. So how are the transitions between the different systems? Um, so uh, the, the, the stepwise functional connectivity uh, uh, analysis is, is able to characterize the particular seed regions or, uh, in terms of to characterize the connectome of these regions in terms of the direct connections, but also the connectivity that are so the, the nodes that are really uh, far from the from the seed. Uh, basically, what we are doing here is asking a very simple question: Is uh, if I'm a Given a, a particular box in the brain, how many paths uh, do I have to the target or to the seed? It, de it depends how you see this from the seed or to, or to the target, but because we don't have uh, directionality in functional relativity, so it's the same. I mean, it's just trying to see how many paths do I have from here to the target in a particular number of link step distance. And that's the key uh, concept here. So we are trying to separate this information to put apart the different distance to the target. So for instance here I have maybe it's not the, the, the contrast is not good but uh, you have uh, two paths from this node to the target you have one and two paths, right? That's why the degree from J to I, I is, is two in, in two link step distance and, and so forth. So in this study, uh, we use resting state functional video MRI and, and stepwise functional connectivity analysis in 100 subjects to investigate the, the connectomes of the three main sensory systems, visual, auditory, and somatosensory. And for instance, this is the case of, of visual cortex. And as you can see in, in the figure, uh, in the third, in the direct connectivity, you know, this is reflects uh, the, the one step distance. What you see is connectivity uh, within the, the occipital lobe. So this, all these are connections that are directly connected to the to the seed in the visual cortex. And it's interesting to see that even in these uh, really early steps of connectivity, uh, we fo it follows the, the dorsal and ventral stream 
of the visual system. And, and even reaching the frontal eye field. But where is this, for, for me, even more interesting is that uh, in, in these five steps maps, uh, we have a set of regions, uh, letter E, F, G, and, uh, G and H, that um, are interfacing you know, the connectivity from the, 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 the primary cortex to the, uh, and the cortical hub. So this network seems to be in between the, these two <coughs> networks. But then uh, the surprising thing is that the somatosensory cortex does something quite similar. So at the beginning you have the local connections in the somatomotor uh, areas, and that's pretty well known because as you know that you have a lot of um, connection across the, the central sulcus. So this is the, con the connectivity that is really local. Uh, it, it is remarkable how this kind of this uh, the receipt is here is in the is in the hand area like to, to reflect the touch sensation so you have connectivity to the uh, somatosensory secondary somatosensory areas in the uh, parietal operculum region here and from there then it jumps the connectivity to the op1 uh, premotor regions ventral premotor regions and again i would like to remark that we are hitting the same very distinct network uh, as we saw before in the visual cortex. So we have superior parietal lobe, parietal operculum, anterior insula, and dorsal ACC. And after that, then the connectivity jumps to the default network, or uh, in our case, it's, it's more the, the cortical hubs uh, regions that we have called the stable state. And I'm gonna go to explain this a little bit uh, later. And finally, uh, uh, so it was it was very really interesting that um, the auditory cortex does exactly the same thing as, as the other three major sensory modalities. So at the beginning, we have the local connectivity, so local connect or, or direct connections. The seed is now in the auditory cortex, and as you see, it hits all the you know belt and parabelt, all the auditory related regions here in the presylvian uh, fissure. And then uh, we have another uh, secondary representation area here in the uh, parietal per OP4, parietal operculum. And, and look at that again. The, we, we are hit, uh, so the, the, uh, the connectivity jumps uh, to the, this very, very distinct set of regions uh, conforming a, a very robust network that is in the middle. Uh, uh, in this flow of connections, if you like, it's in the middle, in between the, the local connectivity in the primary sensory regions and the <coughs> hubs areas. This is to make clear that, that we, we reach an unstable topology uh, uh, after a several, after seven, eight link step distance uh, uh, map. Uh, an important aspect of the a stepwise functional connectivity approach is that th there is not an obvious uh, or a standard uh, number of, of link step distance that, that we can choose, right? Because uh, we have to, you know, characterize this this thing because it depends. Usually, it depends on the resolution of the image, uh, etc. So, uh, but it, but it's really uh, clear that uh, in the in when we compare the maps. Between them, we see that at the beginning, in this part of the graph, in all three modalities, the maps are really different. This is like telling us that that the maps are topologically different between themselves, and in a given point, the maps reach an stable state. That is the the cortical hubs, and that's uh, totally expected um, from our previous analysis in, in the cortical hubs uh, uh, description. What is the data criterion that describes a step? We went from one step to two step, three steps. What data criteria do you use to actually define it as two steps rather than three steps or one step? Do, uh, do you mean the, the so what we are counting is for all the voxels, the, yeah. the exactly number of paths to that uh, reach the target 
I mean, in that number of, of paths, that's, that's what you mean? Or? Well, what defines the path, I mean, in the data? In other words, you're just measuring bold, you know, functional connectivity data. Right? So ah, well, the path is, is just, is similar to the concept of, of path link uh, in, in graph theory, but we don't want to use path link because in this case, uh, I mean, it's totally different. Usually path length is to define the sorted path or the average path length. And that uh, metrics are different, as, so it's not the same information as that we are providing here. Um, but uh, the, the, the step is, let me maybe go back to the, to the method because, so nodes are the region, the box of the brain. Uh, links are the obviously the, co the functional uh, coupling between these two. So what we are doing is taking the individual uh, subject uh, time series, boxes and time. We create the association matrix. It's just the, the correlations between uh, all the boxes in the brain. So we, we have this adjacency matrix that define the graph. And the links are that these two nodes are functionally connected. So you set a threshold on that connectivity. Yeah, it's, all yeah, you know, it's an FDR threshold. So we we define uh, in the past we used this threshold of, of 0.2 in the correlation Pearson correlations, uh, uh, but it's it's about right. So it's it's not far from the right. But if you do a, a um, multiple compressions correlations, so it's it's about that. So it's it's uh, uh, correlations above 0 0.2, 0 0.3, that for functional connectivity is actually pretty good correlations. So you need a significant connection? Yes, significant connection. Okay. So this is very threshold data. I mean, in this case, uh, uh, I trust all the, the tons of data that, that thinks that this is a, a real connecti but, connection but, in the brain. But if you set a threshold of 0.3, you might have to take more paths to get the yeah. Yes. 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 So or one thing is, fewer. and also the the size of the boxes. So one thing that are uh, influencing uh, that are um, important in this uh, uh, method is the resolution and also obviously the, the, the significance of the path. So the, the if you have bigger boxes, then you you do less steps. No? You have small boxes, you have more steps. That's why we need to characterize this with the with the data. So you need to do the this stability ma uh, stability analysis to see how it behaves your, your data because it could change from data to data. And does it? Or are your solutions for the most part pretty stable across multiple data sets, across individuals, etc. No, it's, it's really stable, but uh, for instance if you're using two limiters, I mean we are we are now at our limit of of, of compute uh, computational uh, power. So in this case, we are using eight, eight uh, uh, millimeters uh, boxel size uh, below. So if you can analyze four millimeters. Two millimeters nowadays is really complicated. I mean, I don't know. We don't have the, the uh, as far as I know here, the, the um, computers that you like to, to do it. With four millimeters, you can do it. It takes uh, months, but, um, and obviously, <laughs> and obviously the, the the, with four millimeters, the, we are talking about more steps. But the maps are exactly the same, topological. Have you tried to consider using a sort of connectivity rather than thresholding? <coughs> you mean weighted connectivity? Uh, yeah, we should, yeah, rather than thresholding, say, okay, we just propagate all the weights. Uh, well, the thing is, um, so different different things here. In the, in functional connectivity, um, we know that local connections are really obviously high. Uh, the correlations between boxes that are really close together are is higher than the co uh, boxes that are far away. So uh, I don't know. I don't see the benefit of of uh, applying a weighted um, uh, algorithm because then uh, you have all. Also, to take into account this this balance between connections, because if I build, I mean, if I believe that this far away uh, connectivity, I think we should treat both the local and distant connections in the same way, uh, right? Because uh, what's the point of, of saying, okay, uh, uh, I want this uh, this uh, connection, local connections, to be, I want to benefit these local connections over the far. Connectivity. If I think both are real, so once you, once you define that something is real, 
in the brain or is a, is a significant coupling, I don't see the benefit of applying weighted uh, algorithms. No, I was thinking that then, I mean, that would be less sensitive uh, to the threshold. That's why I mean, yes. I, I see your problem. Yes. And then, so, so to make clear that uh, the finding of this multimodal network that we have called multimodal network because all modalities converge there, uh, you know, to, to make clear that this uh, uh, seems to recruit all the connectivity from all the modalities, what we did is uh, we have called a uh, combined analysis. It's exactly the same ap approach as before, but here we include the three seeds <coughs> as a target regions. Uh, um, so now all the boxes in the brain can go to any of, of, of these um, seeds and the map is, I mean, obviously it's pretty similar to the one that we get before. The, the point of this is because in, in the multimodal uh, field, uh, it's really complicated to try to decide the thresholds between modalities. Right? So people are doing whatever, uh, you know, auditory stimuli, uh, sensory and visual, and now they, they have to do an overall map to see wh which are the commonalities between the regions. And in this case, uh, we, we want to, to try to, to avoid this, this problem of the overlap by running the, the method uh, as a combined uh, uh, seeds. And uh, I mean, we, we are pretty sure that these regions uh, are trimodal. All of them have connectivity to all the regions. And the, the another benefit to this is that for a particular voxel, we can actually quantify the number of links that I have you know, to the somatosensory, to the auditory, to the visual. How many steps is this one? This is uh, the three and five, so it's the more critical steps uh, that I saw before, that I yeah, saw in the other figures. Um, we saw, you can see this in the cortical space. This is a binary map of, of all three components. The local primary component is the red areas, then we have the multimodal network in, in green, and then the cortical hubs in, in blue. And you can also see this at the topological level, network topological level. And I think it's pretty uh, illustrative you know, to see how the different cortex, I mean, need to, to go through this multimodal network that is you know, interfacing, physically inter interfacing the, the other modules to go finally to, to the cortical halves. Yes? Is this something special about the movement from sensation to these cortical hubs, or let's say you took one of those regions that's still gray on that uh, tricolored map and stuck a seed there, would you still wind up in five, three to five steps with this multimodal image and in seven steps with the this is a pretty good observation. So the the um, yeah, obviously we know that in resting state everything is going to collapse uh, in the cortical halves because you know th this is the dominant state in terms of the of the uh, of a network that has the highest amount amount of connections and in, in in a parallel way in a sort of activity way that we call in network. So uh, uh, from Far away modules, you're gonna end up for sure in the in the cortical halves. But the interesting point here is not that you are gonna end up there. Is that you? Uh, which regions are you using to to reach that cortical halves? That obviously obviously is gonna be different in these gray areas that I haven't analyzed because it's not part of, of my interest now. But uh, you will go through another. So uh, they won't go through the blue. No. I mean, because sorry, because for instance, this is you know part of the of the language network, and, and we have done this analysis, and it's going through another network, so not not for instance, the multimodal. Um, and and if we explore in detail the, the multimodal nodes, uh, we can see that they actually conform this 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 network, right? Because you can maybe in the, in, in the previous step, you can thought the uh, you can think that these are uh, final um, uh, terminal steps and from there then you go to, to, to the cortical halves, but that these green are not actually interconnected. But uh, here we are proving that that's not the case. So this network conform 
a cohesion network by himself. And also uh, with this analysis, uh, we were able to to see that the, they are they conform also uh, really robust connectivity access. So parietal operculum and anterior insula are both really uh, tied together. Superior parietal and uh, parietal operculum are also a critical axis of connectivity. That is actually probably a triangle of connectivity because it looks like the posterior temporal, this, this region here that is also multimodal, uh, connects these three, uh, these three regions. And finally, we have these two other net, uh, nodes of the network, is the dorsal attentional, the dorsal ACC and lateral prefrontal. Both of them looks like they, they are more a satellite uh, um, node of the central core, uh, at the parietal operculum and anterior insula core. So in summary, I think is, uh, I mean, in order to, to, to see this more clearly, we, we did is to, to we perform a, a hierarchical analysis of the of the nodes involved in the multimodal network. Uh, and in the hierarchical partition, we show that uh, we, we saw two principal modules. One that is conformed by, uh, by the superior parietal and posterior temporal regions of these two regions. And the other one like is, is more the, the red regions here. Uh, this is, I mean, for, for us it was important because as you may know, the, uh, in attentional literature, um, uh, salience processing literature of, of uh, in this in this particular field, people are arguing that the the main streams are one that is going dorsally, visual, superior parietal, and then uh, frontal eye field. And another one is going ventral, uh, usually you know even traveling the temporal lobe, and another uh, ventral salience network that is. Com uh, that involves the parietal perculum and the anterior insula. And with this work, what we are uh, describing is that, that you know, this dichotomy between dorsal and mental, it seems that it's not um, quite accurate, we, we think, because, the, because we have also this connectivity, really strong connectivity between the dorsal and ventral system. So probably um, the, the merge between the dorsal and mental system uh, and at the tensional level is through this pathway. And one thing that came up while doing this project is that uh, we knew that we could be a little bit biased to, uh, I mean, by using the, the stepwise functional connectivity, you know, biased to the massive connectivity flaws, right? Because uh, it is possible that other, maybe less massive connectivity between modalities exist, but because we are using this uh, uh, method that are uh, highlighting or, or, or um, yeah, highlighting the, 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 the region that has the highest amount of pathways to the seed, we can wash out other meaningful connections. For instance, what we did here is to, is to develop another uh, technique that uh, we call by model interconnectivity. It's really simple as, as this figure. So we define two seeds, for instance, visual and auditory cortex, and we want to see is the, uh, where are these direct interconnectors. And in the figure, we, we saw that the, this is actually a very uh, different information. No? Uh, for instance, these uh, bimodal integrators in A, B, C, or D uh, are not, some of them overlap with the trimodal, but for instance, in this in this case, uh, we have this uh, bimodal region, visual and auditory bimodal region in the temporal, posterior, posterior temporal, uh, that is is quite unique. So it's not in the trimodal map, uh, and we have another uh, auditory somatosensory bimodal uh, region here in the uh, OP4, uh, and also uh, bimodal regions in the dorsal regions of the of visual cortex and parietal lobe. And it was good to replicate something that we knew from, from early work in animal models, that, this, uh, there is, that there are or there is a specific 
regions in the in the brain stem, in particular the superior colliculus, uh, that also integrate the, the three modalities. No? Uh, in our case, because our resolution is not really high, we cannot say that this is actually superior colliculus, but I mean, involves colliculus and also the uh, periglottary matter in the adenosus accumulado. So we are, you know, pretty happy with, with this result because it looks like even at this uh, brainstem level, we can actually also uh, detect the multimodal uh, integration. Finally, I did, we did three additional analyses that I would like to remark. The first one, obviously, was to, to try to replicate this finding with another data set of 100 subjects. And again, we have the, the same network, multimodal network there. The second analysis, additional analysis, is that uh, we were really curious about the, you know, the post potential asymmetries between left and right, uh, because as you may know, all the, the, for instance, the, the neglect subjects uh, or the, the, the neglect condition has been described more frequently in the right hemisphere, and as you see, uh, in the the right hemisphere, the parietal opercular region merge with the superior temporal lobe, superior temporal gyrus, uh, and it's not the case here in the, in the left area, in the left hemisphere. Um, and another interesting observation is that the maps concerning the large link step distances, like here, uh, we have also as interesting asymmetries in the in broadcast area that is definitely larger in the left hemisphere. And I did this analysis uh, mostly because it was like uh, personal curiosity. I wanted to check if the stepwise connectivity transitions were mostly due, due to, to local uh, versus distant uh, connections. Because, I mean, uh, uh, at the theoretical level, potentially could be both or, or could be one more than another. Uh, so uh, we wanted to see if the, this transition from the sensory cortex to the cortical half is due to maybe traveling through the cortex or jumping through very far uh, regions in the cortex. And it looks like the case is, the, is that the distant connections are really the critical ones. Because if you focus your attention here in the, in the maps that only includes local connections, the stepwise connectivity never reach the, the multimodal network. And if you include a, a, an analysis only with the distant connectivity, you see that is, I mean, fairly uh, analogous to the ones that we get uh, in the whole brain connectivity. So, as a conclusion, uh, we describe the multimodal integration network of the human brain by using a novel technique or method called the stepwise functional connectivity analysis. In the study, we also describe the main connectivity axes and modules of this multimodal network. I think we give a, a sense of how is the hierarchical structure of the brain uh, from this sensory cortex to the cortical hubs. And an interesting area of future exploration uh, of, uh, uh, is, you know, is the, um, the application of this method to mm, neuropsychiatric disorders. Because uh, ultimately what we are interested is to see how these kind of properties, organizational properties of the brain, are behaving in the pathologies like uh, you know autism, um, Alzheimer's disease, or or, um, or ADHD, or the different uh, diseases that is likely that the problem is also how these the systems merge between themselves. So finally, I would like to thank my mentors and collaborators, especially. Uh, Keith Johnson, Randy Wagner, and Risa Spelling for their help in all these these projects, and also uh, thank you for your attention.
recognize the importance of those sensations in class versus other species. That's interesting, really interesting question. Uh, the first point, I mean, obviously we wanted to target also those, those two, uh, but people um, in general have difficulties just to try to define. In our case, we are selecting an a priori uh, read, so we, we are selecting the seeds. Uh, for instance, for facial factory sensory systems. So it's even, uh, I mean, it's difficult to see where is the cortical um, primary coordinates, if you like, no? piriform cortex or different, uh, I don't know, it's kind of people, for instance, for, for uh, gustatory, they say, no, it's anterior insula, but in, in our case, definitely anterior insula is, is part of the multimodal network. So, um, I don't know, the, the, the difficulties that we found trying to define these two is just to say, to say where to locate the seed. But it would be really interesting. But probably they, they maybe don't follow the same paths because evolutionary, as you said, it looks that they are more primitive. Yeah. Have you um, uh, looked at any of the, your uh, uh, anatomical connectivity data, the diffusion data, to see whether you get any uh, similar kind of trends when doing a connectivity analysis uh, mm. for those connectivity matrices? So the assumption here is that the, the very strong uh, functional connectivity and uh, correlations are probably due to, to anatomical connectivity, to real track connectivity. But as you know, you know the, the, uh, many of these connections, actually I have this to illustrate exactly that point. <laughs> so the, the cerebellum, we know that they, they don't have direct connectivity. It's all polysynaptic connections through the pontine grid. So, and we're still having functional connectivity coupling and we even meaningful transitions in this method. So uh, what I would say is that uh, we are including direct anatomical connections, but, pro but also including multisynaptic connectivity. So uh, it could be interesting to see tracks, but I would be surprised if some of these are not have we looked to see whether it shows up? Well, what I did is uh, looking or uh, searching in the monkey literature. So anatomical tracing. And I mean, uh, the major, the most important ones, especially the the connectivity axis uh, in the in the multimodal network, are supported by direct connections in the monkey literature. In humans, I'm not sure. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to read the paper, actually. Is it published? No, we just submitted last week, so. Oh, OK. Yeah. Okay, we'll read Could I ask you then maybe some of the questions about methodology? So you have yes. resting state data, and you're calculating uh, PLC correlation from other ones. Well, quite a few other ones, I guess, to, to get the network, right? Yes. Uh, and without any pan transcribing or anything? Well, the, the first point is to build a network the, to, for the graph, so to have the graph for each subject. Then run the analysis. Okay, so yeah, that was the next question. So you, you don't ever show the adjacent symmetric? No. Or the actual the piercing correlation? No, the average is done in the final results. But there is with a lot the of pre-process. Sorry. Yeah. There is lots of pre-process before yes. you do the correlation. Okay. But yeah. So, I mean, I asked about that test to bring. So is, is that part of the pre-processing? All these pre-processing rely on, in, on the, uh, I mean, common sources of, of fancy connectivity MRI that we have. So, or, or is okay, okay, so at some point you have one network over all subjects, no? But that, that's what I'm So the first point is to have the, the data filter for all the things that, we, or regressing out all the things that, you know, physiological noise, all the things that we don't believe that they are meaningful information. And then after that, you build the graph, and then after that, you run the, the graph theory algorithm. Right, so you have one graph for all subjects, and on that one, you run the seed-based endpoints. Yes. Uh, so another question we have is how do you normalize that? Because all your maps go between zero and one, but obviously yeah. you would get an arbitrary number. That's a to, to that pretty a smart question. The, so obviously in the in all these steps, the, the counts are different because in the first step is, is really tiny. You yeah, and you might have so loops, right? If you say seven connections, that might just go around the whole cortex. Are you yeah, yeah, yeah. so in, in, a, in a given point, you, you, if you keep running the, in the number of steps, you, you are going to increase like by, by a factor of, uh, I mean, a lot of con uh, uh, 
final count for, for each voxel. So that's why you have to do a normalization between the, the maps because otherwise it's going to be really difficult to, to find a common threshold. What I'm doing is, is just doing a t test with the entire sample and taking the, I mean, above, uh, so the, the, the lower part uh, is, is the above point one oh one sorry point oh oh one um the t the p value the t test and then the maximum is the maximum t value. Is is this clear? Uh, yeah, it's a normal I mean you can do a seed score or whatever yeah, like. test on, on which distribution sorry. It's a one sample t test with one the entire sample. Uh, so the distribution is the distribution of number of connections between the nodes. Okay, but well that's that's getting too deep now. Yeah, maybe we can skip okay, it. Um, so that you had a slide about the spatial correlation. Yes. At first, I was thinking that there shouldn't be any overlap between, like, say, the, the, the map of two-step networks and three-step networks. Well, there is a, it's a transition. I'm not showing, for instance, in this case, as you see, I'm showing one, three, five. So it, this one is because it's redundant, but it's, it's like the transition between. So you have commonalities between the, the steps. It makes sense, right? Yeah, but anyway, the spatial correlations you're having, they are the spatial correlations between what exactly, yeah. What, what I'm doing is taking the, 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 I mean, I'm vectorizing the voxels in each map and then correlating this with the next map and the next map. I can show you how, so how to do it. So between the steps? Yes, because between the steps. And then you yes. again. This is yes, this is exactly the, the point of transition. Uh -huh. I mean, when, sorry, when the maps are highly uh, not uh, equal or different, highly different. Most separate. Most separate, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, thanks. Oh. If you were um, to repeat this using some kind of a driving stimulus, like playing a video game or something like that, do you think you would end up with the same uh, you know, total networks? Yes, you know, we did exactly the same thing, but they are uh, wandering around a maze, virtual maze. And, and with auditory uh, stimuli as well, in other words? No, this is all visual. Uh, and obviously that it's totally different, so uh, we see the, um, uh, how the, the final st state of, the, of this stepwise connectivity is not the default mode. It's a network that engage, uh, that involves the, the hand movement and all the, the hippocampus, parhippocampus, uh, and temporal lobes are probably related with But if you look at three steps, the, the map should be relatively similar. In, in, in the in the first part of transitions, yes, is this visual, I mean, dorsal ventral, most, mostly, in that, in that case, more your ventral, ventral stream. Interesting. It changes. Yes. I have a question. Does the coherence time of the networks change the, um, what the final map looks like, for example, if you would be able to sample faster to image, to have a fra faster frame rate than one, two seconds or <coughs> whatever you have now in fMRI, if you would be able to do it twice or four times faster, would the number of convergence steps change, for example, from seven to, I don't know, five or nine? No, and the, also the, f the geographic map, the distribution of the map. No. For resting state, uh, once you, you have a um, I mean, this is actually a, a work that has been done also for Kune, uh, done this before, trying to, to um, opti not characterize which is, are the best parameters to, to uh, have the final maps of uh, functional connectivity. And usually it depends on the number of, of time course. No? So if you only take 20 time, time points, so, so the, uh, the maps are going to be really crappy. But once you um, are above you know, 100 or, uh, in three seconds, 100. So you, you have a really robust one. And we also did uh, perform this in different, like two seconds, three seconds, and it all are the same. So what I'm saying is that it's more in that uh, if you think that the final map is, is, uh, is good, so it's not like uh, 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 back quality. So then the, the final uh, stepwise map is gonna be good. Question. Um, okay, so maybe you can find the speaker again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
was a great talk. Thank you. 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 Thank